I'm Nashley Borsico. I use she, her pronouns. I am class of 2022, and I am a DMC ambassador, a part of the archive team. The Archive is a project that aims to make lectures and media of past events accessible to the Hamilton community. The video recordings of the Archive are broken down into demographic and issue-based themes. This video is a compilation showcasing the major themes of the Archive and a teaser for what's to come. I'm Jason Casado. Um, I'm part of Class of 2024. I'm using him pronouns and I'm on the DMC Archive team. Well, the section I'm introducing is the social justice and activism section, which I think is very important because watching all these videos will show you the history of how social justice has kind of transformed in our different communities. And I think it could be inspiring to different people to try and create their own forms of activism. You won't see that, I would argue, you know, uh, in, in most aspects of popular media that tries to uh, depict minority performances, right? Or minority lives and minority emotions, right? Um, so performances like, like uh, um, Gomez's and performance histories and legacies like that of Bola Nieve, I'm suggesting are really important for us to look to and analyze, right? In relationship to the ways in which we're often overwhelmed by a kind of sanitized, domesticated image of ourselves, where certain particularities, uh, when I say us, I mean different kind of groups, some of which I belong to, some of which I don't, um, but their relationship to a bigger mainstream sanitizing media process, right? And the ways in which these performances of excess and extravagance are really useful to think about um, uh, what's important about difference, right? So I'll stop there and I'll answer it. Integrating this privilege into one's life partly means accepting a greater responsibility. This privilege, you know, often we in America, we don't look at what we have. We look at, you know, what somebody 50 grand above us has, and we say, I don't have that, right? I know, I, you know, I went to Hamilton College, but I mean, we never had summers in Switzerland. You know, I mean, we, so we do that. Instead of saying, right, right, I, you know, so I've got this privilege and, and let me ante up responsibility. All of this is happening in a country where one th the lives of one third of young black men your age are in some way restricted by the criminal justice system. It's happening in that context. It's happening in the context of a country where a large minority of children grow up in poverty. It's happening in a country where just as the 80s and 90s stock boom concentrated wealth, we are also concentrating poverty uh, and hyper-segregation, creating a greater marginality of the inner city. The sense of a larger community informs the anger and anxiety, the often inarticulate rage and frustration of students who are not down with things as they are because though they love the privilege, they also see the ways that the privilege is implicated in oppressing others. There is room in our system for that protest. There is room and because there always has been room, there also has been and will continue to be change. That uh, gives me enormous hope. And that's one of the things that that very education taught me. It's the possibility of change and the incredible power of individuals. By and large, in the 20th century, most of the population was being prepared for factory work. And the country just simply has not retooled its education system. Um, so that uh, we have an education system which prepares students uh, for knowledge work. So hi, my name is Luna Zhou. Uh, I'm in the class of 2024. My intended major is government and econ, and I'm currently working uh, in the MC uh, as part of the archive team. Uh, I want to join in archive team for the reason that uh, I want to be involved in the process of uh, recording the history of the MC. 
Um, one thing I really like about working in the archive team is that uh, I get to see the posters uh, maybe made like 10 or 20 years ago about the events that helps with amplifying the voices of minority groups at Hamilton College. And I really like to uh, knowing about those process uh, through my work with the archive team. So the two videos I picked are under the theme of race and class. The first video uh, is named Education Inequality, uh, given by lecturer Dr. Uh, Kappa Rogers. And in her lecture, she talks about the three levels of racism. And uh, she also introduced the coping strategies and how um, does racism impact on people's mental health. Uh, in the second video, um, is was given by um, Brian Peterson. Uh, the name of the lecture is Higher Learning, Maximizing Your College Experience. Uh, I really like about the part in the lecture where he talks about learning is creating opportunities one for oneself. And also he introduced about uh, how to learn, how to study in college, and the importance of studying independently and knowing why we are learning. many other slaves, many other people who have had difficulties in their history, you know, like the Holocaust, right? So my answer to that is the reason why a focus in America tends to be on African Americans is because we are the long on African American justification, you all didn't know, um, in case that was a surprise for you. Um, <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> so, um, so I inappropriate people all the time because this is very uncomfortable. Okay, so I just throw out those all the time. So, uh, we are the longest standing group that has suffered from the kind of systemic uh, and institutionalized racism and discrimination and continue to suffer from that. So, there's a, um, I'll talk more about this particular aspect later, but it's interesting because when we think about Africa, right, and so, we think about apartheid in Africa. It's pretty much a Jim Crow here, in case you never really thought about that. But apartheid in Africa, and then all of a sudden, like Africans are doing pretty well with their race relations, right? Overall, right? In terms of looking at it for America and looking at Africa, why are they doing what I would consider to be better, that's in my opinion, than America is doing? You know why? Because they acknowledge, they admit, they apologize. And they don't skirt the issue when it's brought up again. When visitors go and they say, hey, so what about that apartheid? They kind of say, yeah, it sucked. And we're really embarrassed about it. And we're doing better now. It's not like the American way, which is, well, slavery was all so many years ago, and there was some talk about this, and these race only exist anyway. So we kind of deal with it by not dealing with it, which further perpetuates the difficulty of moving on. When you're in college, you're going to be your own teacher. You have to guide how you learn the material. You have professors who you should look more or less as, as facilitators. They're going to help you, and the more the more that you invest yourself in the learning process, the more that you want to explore things on your own and figure out how do I get through this? How do I get what I need out of this? Hi, my name is Paola Lopez, and I'm the director of the Days Masolo Center. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I get to introduce to you the section of our archive that is about public health. As many are aware, we're still in the process of a global pandemic. And what this particular video section highlights is the health disparities of those with marginalized identities and possibly how to use poetry and literature to connect the human experience to how we define, how we talk about illness, especially with those within marginalized communities. And again, I wanna wonder with you whether that alternative, that other uh, narrative of illness has equal, if not perhaps more important value in understanding how to best treat that illness, how to best respond to that illness, uh, how to best uh, 
be a kind of healer in the larger sense in response to that illness. Um, and, and, and as part of that questioning, I, I, I next want to propose whether literary writing, particularly poetry and uh, literary nonfiction or create, so-called creative nonfiction, might be a kind of useful bridge between these two models of understanding illness. Might accounts of illness told through poems, uh, through other kinds of narratives, uh, be useful to us in medicine uh, to become better healers, but also useful to our patients in, in terms of how to better live with illness. And, and I think that uh, uh, we, we might begin to th understand that possibility better by, by acknowledging that perhaps some of these modes of expression are culturally sanctioned and therefore less suspect than the biomedical model of illnesses. If we think of the African-American experience of Tuskegee and the, the skepticism, I would say, that, that uh, in the African-American community uh, that relates to biomedicine as, as a consequence of, of those events, uh, where, again, storyte storytelling, poem making, uh, expressions that come from community that are expressions of community might perhaps be, in some senses, more welcome, more useful. Well, this section's about class, and I think the class section is really important because I think often we forget about how big of a role class and class struggles have had in American history, and I think um, class and race really intertwine a lot throughout the history of, of our country, and I think this section's videos can kind of highlight that. Today, what I would like to do is I'd like to offer a slightly different way of thinking about relationships between African Americans and Latinos in the United States. Instead of just conceptualizing these groups as two, um, as two separate populations, I want to encourage us to think about the extent to which they produce each other, what we call relational ethnic studies. And that's really kind of moving away from the idea that these are two discrete static groups and begin to think about racial ethnic groups as processes, as always in flux, as being produced um, by structures and certainly by each other, okay? behavior is both actively racist, but you can also think about racist behavior or attitudes or the other use the word behavior here as passive, sometimes passive behavior. Not taking action can reinforce that system. So then the question is, well, can you interrupt the cycle of racism? Um, the analogy I use in the um, book, if we think of the cycle of racism, the socialization we receive growing up, the way it gets reinforced, the messages we get growing up, and then the way we internalize those messages, and then later repeat them, or pass them on to our children, sometimes without thinking. If we think about that process as a cycle, you can think about that, the analogy I use in the book is a cycle, um, like the moving walkway at the airport, right? Having just come from the airport today, you know, there's a moving walkway at the airport. You can just stand still on that walkway, and you can carry it along. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to be actively moving. You can be very passive and still you get carried along. And if we think about the cycle of racism as like that, as being something that just carries you along, um, whether you are moving or not, then we can think about how would you interrupt that process. If you wanted to interrupt that process, the thing you'd need to do would be to do what? If you don't want to go where that moving walkway is taking you, how would you interrupt that process? You'd get off. Now, how would you get off? You have to walk the other way, right? Not only do you have to walk the other way, you have to walk the other way faster than the conveyor belt is going, right? You could just turn around, right? But if you just turn around and don't walk, you're just being carried backwards, right? But you're still going in that same direction. So you have to, you have to turn the other way and you have to move more quickly than the conveyor belt is moving. You have to be very active. Welcome to the gender and sexuality portion of this part of the archive. The videos in this section explore themes of sexuality and gender identity, everything from the experience of those who are going through the refugee and immigration experience and, and the tragedy and trauma that comes with the asylum process of those who are LGBTQ identifying, as well as those who are in the black community and their journey with their LGBTQ identity. In addition, what does it take for our uh, bro code partners to become feminist and rewriting the bro code? So this is a fun and interesting section. I hope you learn quite a bit and can move from educational experiences to allyship and potentially an accomplice. 
Um, first of all, nobody knew whether uh, government would accept LGBT asylum seekers. I mean, there was that Toboso Alfonso, the gay Cuban case that I mentioned, but before 1994, that was just one case. We could, you know, hold it up and argue it to courts, but it didn't really buy the court to do anything. Um, there was a little bit of a trickle of news that Canada, Australia, some Scandinavian countries, some other European countries were starting to recognize asylum seekers who were, uh, who were fleeing sexual orientation based persecution. But it was like, it was a different world from now. It was really a trickle. And in my world, which is partly a world of law review articles, there wasn't a single article out there about this issue other than actually one that I wrote a long, long time when I was, when I was uh, just starting out to do the work. And part of the reason that somebody might write an article like that, or maybe that I was thinking about writing an article like that, is that then the lawyers who are arguing these cases have something to cite. Say, look, okay, we don't have a lot of cases, but look, there are these law review articles that say this or, or, or you know, in, in, that address this particular issue. In other words, we need to move beyond the shallow analysis of LGBT rights because as we see, race, class, gender, immigration status, disability, and the like can all change the material conditions through which you are able to even access some of these supposed quote-unquote rights. And some gay persons right may, might also be another gay person's demise, right, if we use the military as an example. We as men are socialized to listen to others. It's part of our dysfunction. Women from the women's movement have been saying forever, we've been saying these things for 45, 50 years. You know, <coughs> suddenly guys come up and, and, and we're supposed to take it seriously. We've been saying this for 50 years. And the answer is, they have. They absolutely have. It's women who started this movement, not men. The sad part, the dysfunctional part of being a man is we're socialized not to listen to them, to minimize their views, to minimize their opinions. And so that's part of the problem. It takes men sometimes to get through the other man. Now this film is going to be a little edgy because bro culture isn't, isn't clean, it's not funny, it's not pretty. Welcome to this section of the archive where we're going to explore themes on disability. This particular speaker highlights the experiences of people with disabilities and what it means to live in a post-ADA era. I hope that you can enjoy these educational experiences and start to have a conversation about how to reduce ableist practices in your world. The feeling of aloneness meets up with the feeling of possibility given to you by other people with disabilities who see the world and their place in it in a different way. The gift that Simi and Ed and Judy and others gave me was the gift to redefine disability, to throw out the old definition that didn't work, that didn't fit. If it had worked, then why would we have 54 million people in this country, an overwhelming majority 65% of them or more not working 